God's house this morning, would you stand as we sing together? here to glorify your name. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you today because you are our rock and our redeemer. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you welcome someone to worship this morning? It is a joy to see you in worship this morning. <clears throat> Several things we want you to know about uh, that are happening this week in the life of our church. Um, this Wednesday night is movie night for our kids. This is a family event. Um, because of some air, heat and air issues, we still don't know where that event is going to be, but we'll know by Wednesday night. So you just look for um, an email or a reminder from Elizabeth, uh, the movie, Elizabeth, I forgot. Sing Too is the movie for the kids, so we hope that you will be here for the kids' movie night. CWA's is this Tuesday. So for those of you who may not know, CWA stands for Comfortable with Age. It's our group for senior adults. Um, and anybody who's comfortable with age, that meeting is at 11 o'clock in Bobo Hall. Um, the Friendly Neighbors Quartet from Greenwood will be doing our entertainment, and then we will enjoy a meal by Till Culbertson. If you have not signed up yet, you may sign up when the pew pads are passed in just a few minutes. Um, there is a hike, Andrew, a hike on Tuesday to Lake Conesty Preserve. If you have not signed up for that hike and would like to participate, today on the pew pads is your last chance to sign up for that. So please, um, please sign up if you'd like to be a part of that with the recreation ministry. It's a joy to see you in worship this morning. Would you pass the pew pads at this time if you're on the inner 
um, end of the row and pass those down so that we might have a record of your visit. You may use those pew pads to let us know about prayer requests, to let us know about changes in emails or phone numbers, any information that, that you need to let us know about, we'll, we'll get it from those pew pads. It's a joy to see you today. I was so hoping that our 40 young people who went to Sun Power this week were going to be here today to talk to you, to sing for you, and to share with you what a wonderful, wonderful week we had. Our wonderful week turned into not so wonderful a week yesterday when three of our students tested positive for COVID, so they are not here today and they will speak to you another day. Um, I want to let you know just a little bit about the trip, and then during the, the offering, you'll see some slides from, from our trip. Um, Sun Power is, is an organization devoted to student worship. Our students, um, our students participated in, in missions, in music, in worship, in Bible study, this was in Nashville. Um, it, was just, it was just a great week. I want you to know, and I'll say it again when they are here to, to talk to you because I want them to know also, we have great kids. They are, they're so polite, they're so well-mannered. Every restaurant we went to, a waitress would say to me, what nice, polite kids we have. The hotel staff said to me many times, what nice, polite kids we have. And I appreciate that. I appreciate you parents. I appreciate you church family for instilling that into our children. Our kids only have one bad quality. They have an aversion to sleeping. <laughs> they don't want to sleep. At 2 o'clock in the morning, they're still in my room talking, sitting out in the hallway talking. They're not being bad. They're just, they just love being together. And if they love being together that much, I'll stay up with them all night. Um, they don't like to sleep. And so, David, I will try my best to stay awake during your sermon this morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it just, it just was a reminder to me that the more opportunities we can offer our kids to be together, the fewer opportunities they will have to be somewhere they shouldn't be. And I appreciate, I appreciate what you as a church do to provide these opportunities for our youth. On Tuesday evening, we went to the Nashville Inner City Missions. It's a huge organization that, um, where, where all of the homeless in Nashville are, are helped. It's an organization that receives donations from Amazon and Walmart, and they had received huge pallets, hundreds of pallets of donations that nobody had had time to, to go through and separate. And so on Tuesday night, we went to their big, big unheated warehouse, and we worked for about three hours unloading those pallets, and our kids, without complaining, for the most part, <laughs> helped unload those pallets and divided, divided it into men's socks, children's pajamas, just big, big containers all, all the way around the outside of this warehouse. They separated those containers um, to help this mission get back on its feet and be able to distribute um, these items. You'll see pictures of that um, the kid, when the kids ha have on their kind of light pale green t-shirts 
that's when we were at this inner city mission um, working for the evening. On Wednesday evening, we packed medical kits for Voice of the Martyrs. Voice of the Martyrs is an organization um, whose purpose is to help persecuted Christians around the world. These medical kits will be sent to, um, to, to those persecuted Christians, many of whom have been forced out of their homes because of persecution. We packed medical kits to send. We also have 40 medical kits here with us. Um, if you would like to take one of those medical kits home and fill that, parents, it'd be a great way to begin to teach your kids about giving to missions. I think it would cost about $30 to fill this kit. The instructions are right there in the bag. I think it would cost about $30 and I think it would cost 10 to $15 to ship it. If you'd like to pick one up, they're in a box right here on the front pew. All the instructions are there, very self-explanatory, um, and we would love your help with that. Wednesday night, we had some free time, and we went on a dinner cruise. We thoroughly enjoyed the dinner cruise that went around the Cumberland River into the heart of the city of Nashville, we heard some good country music and enjoyed our free time that night. On Thursday, Nicole C. Mullen came and spoke to our kids. Our kids, I was just enamored because I used to love to listen to Nicole C. Mullen. Our kids had no idea who Nicole C. Mullen was. But that by the end of the evening, they were enamored with her as well. She is big on teaching scripture memorization. And in about five minutes, um, now she's got the moves and she's got the beats and she knows, how, she, knows, she knows how to get these kids to remember it. But in about five minutes, all of our kids had memorized the verse, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. All of our kids can quote that verse for you. They probably can't quote, quote it without dancing and tapping their foot, but that's okay. And in about 15 minutes, they learn the first six verses of Psalm 139. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. They learn the first six verses of that and they can dance and quote those six verses as well. Um, Nicole C. Mullen was a, a, a big hit for our kids um, and, and really, really stressed to them the importance of scripture memorization. It was a wonderful week, and I want to thank you for your support. This was an expensive trip. And if our kids had had to pay everything for it so, and we didn't help at all, our kids couldn't have afforded it. So you as a church have helped, and I'm very grateful. I'm grateful for the way you love and support our children and our youth. It was a great week, and I look forward um, to them telling you about our week. And you'll see some pictures of it during our offering.
pray with me? Father, we come before you thankful for the opportunities that you have gifted us. Lord, we have heard and will see of the opportunities that our students have had in this past week to learn more about you and what it means to worship you with all aspects of our lives. We've seen opportunities for worship through fellowship and fun in the upcoming weeks, and we gather here with the opportunities to worship and to praise you here in this place. Lord, we know that those opportunities are important and they are special and they come alongside the, op the opportunity to serve you in this world. And so we offer these tithes and offerings to you that you may use them to create opportunities for your word and your gospel to spread in this church and in this community and around the world. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's right. 
goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for proving over and over again that nothing is impossible for you. There is no sickness you cannot heal, no disease you cannot cure, no heart you cannot hold, and no darkness you cannot drive out. You're above all things, and it is by you that all things are held together. You alone are holy. And today we come to this place to give you thanks for all that you've done for us and for all that you are. But Father, as you know us, you know that we come to this place today as imperfect people. It is so easy for us to drift at times from you. And so today we ask for your forgiveness of our sins. Search our hearts and reveal to us those areas where we have made our lives more about us than about you. And by your grace, restore us into a right relationship with you. And Father, today we pray for those who we know and love, who are experiencing the storms and the difficulties of this life, for those who find themselves under the shadow of sickness, of great loss, and other difficulties. We pray that these would know your presence and healing touch in these days, and that they would know the comfort, peace, and hope that can only be found under the shadow of your wings. And finally, Father, we thank you for your incredible love for us, a love that is never based on anything we say or do, but, Father, it's a love that's based on the simple fact that we are your children. And on this day and all the days to come, may that love be the centerpiece of our lives. And may your kingdom come. And your will be done, both in our hearts and in this world. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I want to offer my thanks to everyone who helped make Sun Power possible. Adair, thank you so much for stepping in for the children, uh, for the youth, excuse me excuse me, (laughs) and uh, giving the report. I look forward to hearing from them, but for all who made it possible, thank you. Those kind of experiences shape a lifetime. Our scripture passage today comes from Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 28. See if any of these words sound familiar to you around here. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher, you have truly said that 
He is one, and besides Him there is no other. And to love Him with all our heart and with all our understanding and with all our strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that He answered wisely, He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Great Britain during the Second World War, often spoke in a way that gave us memorable quotes. One of my favorites of Churchill is this. We shape our buildings, and afterwards, our buildings shape us. I don't know if you've ever heard that one from Churchill. We shape our buildings, and afterwards, our buildings shape us. Today, I want to tell you a story of how this happened in, in our church. And hopefully this story will point us to the passage that I have just read and will help us understand the meaning of what Jesus called the greatest commandment. Thirty years ago, this summer, First Baptist Church opened the Family Life Center and the Rotunda Building. It was dedicated on August 23, 1992. It was a time of great promise and celebration as this had been dreamed about for many years and planned and worked and people had given and now it was time to open up to new opportunities for ministry. It was a great day and it was my great joy to be pastor of the church during that time. In the months leading up to the summer of 1992, the building committee and the staff saw a feature in the building that, to be honest, we had never asked the architects to put in there. But we began to notice it. Woven into the design of this new building was what is called a Celtic cross. You could see it as you looked at the rotunda doors. You can see it to this day. A large cross with a circle as you entered the building. And then as you saw the railings in that new building, in the Family Life Center or in the rotunda, the railings had these Celtic crosses. We hadn't requested that, but, but the architects had thought that might be a good Thing to include in the building. Our building was being shaped by the expertise of architects and contractors, and then eventually that began to shape us. Would this new feature of a Celtic cross be an appropriate symbol for our church, I wondered? Hmm. So I had a conversation with Jim Cothran, Jim, you awake back there? I'm going to talk about you a little bit, so, all right. And he determined that there would be enough wood left from the tree that we had to cut down to build the building. Jim had wisely saved that wood, and it was cured in whatever wood people do. He had done it. And there was enough of that left to fashion a Celtic cross, a large one that could go up against a wall in the new building. But you see, it wasn't just any tree that was cut down. It was the one that Dr. J.A. Barksdale planted when the first church house was built on this lot. There was emotion tied in cutting down that tree. But now the wood of that tree began to take on a different purpose as it was fashioned into that 
cross that hangs on the wall. This Celtic cross that was being shaped into our building and that began to be placed up against the wall has been a Christian symbol for hundreds of years. The cross, of course, reminds us of the cross of Jesus Christ where we see God's love poured out in the death of Jesus on the cross. It also reminds us of our commitment as Jesus called up us to take up our cross and follow him. That's the cross. The circle that's placed on the cross is a symbol for eternity. And that makes sense. Does a circle have an end? <laughs> no, a circle just goes on and on and on. That's a great symbol for eternity. It's also a symbol for unity in that it's just a circle. There's no special part of it. There is a sense of unity and eternity in a circle. So you put the cross and a circle together, as the Celts did many years ago, and you have this beautiful symbol of, of the love of Jesus and our response to that love of Jesus as we follow him and the eternal life that is given to us, and we have the Celtic cross as a symbol for that. Well, I'm grateful to Jim Cothran for his craftsmanship that put that large cross up on the wall in the Family Life Center building. I'm also grateful there were enough scraps of that wood from that tree left over that he made small versions of that Celtic cross for the building committee and, and the pastor. And for 30 years, that smaller version has hung on my study wall, reminding me of you and of Jesus. And I'm grateful for that reminder. Well, up to this point in the story, all of this was happening behind the scenes. Our contractor was working in the building, and uh, members of the church couldn't just walk in and stroll around. I'm sure some of you found ways to sneak in and do that, but you weren't supposed to. It was a construction zone. It was behind the scenes. But soon as we approached the summer when we were going to open things up, we needed to have a more public version of this Celtic cross. And so I looked at the cross and I saw that the cross and the circle creates four quadrants in the circle. What words might go with that, uh, those four quadrants? Is there something that was ever said that could be broken down into four words? Something very important, something that was most important for us to know and remember and live by. And then I remembered the the greatest commandment. You're to love the Lord your God. Love your Lord with heart, soul, mind, and strength. <laughs> the preacher in me also thought, there's a four-week sermon series right there. And so in June, 30 years ago, this month, I began a four-week sermon series on loving God with all our heart. That was the first week. And we unveiled the logo. Now that's a picture of the bulletin, the worship bulletin from the first Sunday of June, 1992, 30 years ago. Our printer at that time was Lloyd's of Lawrence. David Hammond worked with me. He... he took the words in the Celtic cross, he fashioned that in a simple form, and we began to use it. And then began to introduce this idea of, of heart, soul, mind, and strength, began to talk about how this was the greatest commandment, and the church then by August was ready to see all of those Celtic crosses as we opened up the new building. So, what can these, what can all of this say to us today as we come back 30 years later to think about 
this picture. Now, over the years, it has taken on different variations. If you look at your bulletin cover today, you know, it stylistically looks different, but it's still the Celtic cross, and there's still the words heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we see it all throughout the church, calling us to this greatest commandment. And so, what can we learn from this greatest commandment today? Well, we seem today in our world to have sort of an obsession with ranking things, making lists of all the top things. What's the greatest? Someone even came up with an acronym, you know the word, GOAT. Greatest of all time. Who's the GOAT? That's a strange word picture for me, for someone who's the greatest, <laughs> to call him a GOAT. And yet we do that, so is Tom Brady. Is he the GOAT when it comes to pro quarterbacks? My nine-year-old grandson Liam is, is uh, learning to play basketball and is getting infatuated with basketball. I'm trying to train him up right. And, and so he says to me, so Pop, who was the greatest, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? <laughs> How can I answer? And yet here a nine-year-old is trying to figure out who is the GOAT. This coming holiday weekend, a week from now, any number of radio stations, they will have their list of the top 400, 500, thousand songs, you know, of all time. What's the greatest? We have this infatuation with the greatest of all time. But that's nothing new. Because a man came to Jesus years ago, and he said to him, which commandment is the first of all? That's how our text began. One of the scribes, a man who was a, a person of the law, who came to him and said, which commandment is the greatest? He would have been one who knew the commandments, who lived with them and worked with them as a person of the religious law of that day. Which one is the greatest of them all? And Jesus replied by quoting from the Old Testament. Now, the first part of his quote was a variation on Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, when Jesus said, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Then Jesus went right on and coupled a second commandment with the first as if the two are inseparable. That when we think of the greatest commandment, it's not one of these. He later said, there's nothing greater than this. It's these together. And the second one, he quoted from Leviticus 19.18. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Well, the scribe heard what Jesus said. And in, in fact, the scribe congratulated Jesus on being right. Imagine that. Oh, Jesus, you got the answer right. Well, of course he did. But the scribe was congratulating, and then he even went on to say, you know, those commandments, they are greater than the religious rituals of our day, the whole burnt offerings, the sacrifices, the things that we do when we go to the temple. What you're saying, it's even more important than the ritual. And Jesus came back to him and said, you're right. In fact, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You are understanding what this new movement of God's kingdom on the earth is all about. It is about loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself. I'm glad that over the years the church has used these words, whether they're placed on a bus, or I saw them in the pictures a few minutes ago, you know, from Nashville, or whether it's on a bulletin cover, or anywhere. 
Because this is what Jesus said matters most. Now, there are three lessons I get from this. First of all, there is one God. The Lord is one, Jesus said. The Lord is one. That was the the dominant theme of the whole Old Testament. That's what separated the Hebrews apart from all the other religions. All the other religions had multiple gods and they worshiped all these other gods. But the Hebrews, they had one God. The Lord is one. And Jesus was affirming that and saying there's only one true God. So hear, O Israel... This was known as the Shema, because Shema means to hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, and we have one God. And the second thing then, if we have one God, we are to give all of our lives in total devotion to this one God. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's all of us. That's every dimension of us. That's that's total devotion. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because of one God, and if there's only one true God, then our total allegiance is to God. And then the third one is the love of God cannot be separated from the love of other human beings. In other words, Jesus put the two together. He said, love God with all your being because there's one holy God, love God, but also also love your neighbor as you love yourself. You can't love God with all your being and not love your neighbors. They go together, Jesus said. They're inseparable. Now, on another occasion, he had had a very similar conversation. We find it in Luke chapter 10. Another one of these um, uh, lawyers, nothing against lawyers, these were just the people who who were dealing with the law of their day. They were working with the commandments. And so they were asking the questions. And this one in Luke 10, beginning with verse 25, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life, he said. He said to him, what is written in the law, knowing that he was one of these experts in the law. What do you read there? And he answered, and it's almost a direct quote from our scripture passage today. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The man knew the law. He knew he was supposed to love God with all of his being and love his neighbor. But he was hoping, trying to vindicate himself, he was hoping he might have some wiggle room on who was defined as his neighbor. I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but but who exactly is my neighbor? Is it people just like me? Because I'm not sure about loving them over there. And then Jesus told a parable. It's one of the most famous parables he ever told. Immediately following in response to that question, Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Uh, The hero of the story, as you remember, is this Samaritan, this outcast, this one who was hated by the, the Jews of that day, this one who was considered not worthy of their attention. He was the one who came to the rescue, who showed love and compassion. And at the end of the story, Jesus said, so who was the neighbor? Who was neighborly? 
And the scribe said, the, the one who showed compassion, of course. Jesus answered once and for all that everyone is our neighbor, that we, we don't just draw lines and leave certain people out and those who are on the margins and, and box in and, okay, I'll love this little bunch right here, but not everybody else. So, what about today? How do we apply all of this in our lives today? Well, I want to go back to the, the quote from Churchill. It's interesting, I've used those words for a number of years. We shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. That's a great quote. I've been through enough building programs in different churches that that's where it comes in handy. But the whole quote from Churchill it actually was given after the bombing raid that destroyed the House of Commons in London. The full quote is this, on the night of, from Churchill, on the night of May 10, 1941, with one of the last bombs of the last serious raid, our House of Commons was destroyed by the violence of the enemy and we now have to consider whether we should build it up again and how and when. We shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Having dwelt and served for more than 40 years in the late chamber and having derived very great pleasure and advantage therefrom, I naturally should like to see it restored in all essentials to its old form, convenience, and dignity. Churchill was trying to rebuild what had been destroyed. And I'm going to say that the three things I just mentioned, which I think were the timeless lessons of this greatest commandment, and this, it's the greatest because Jesus said it was, those three lessons are in danger of being destroyed. And that's why this commandment is so important for us today. Let's go back to him. There is one God. The Lord is one. Today we're in danger of having too many gods. Gods, not so much as great deities, but the things that claim our attention and our devotion and the admiration of our lives. We have too many gods in our culture, small g, but we worship them. So we make gods of our own pleasure and comfort and happiness. We make gods out of our politics, politicians and ideologies. We make gods out of power and control and influence. We we make gods out of possessions and prosperity and materialism and the list could go on and on. There's so many things that are out there claiming our attention and our worship and our devotion. We need to come back and hear the Lord is one. There is one God who is to be worshipped with all of our devotion. Which leads to the second thing, because we do have all of these other gods and competing interests and things that are so important to us, it, it's easy to push the one true God to the side and sort of have a nod to God and, you know, tip to the Almighty in the offering plate, and, but, but not love God with all of our being, heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's easy to push God aside. And that's dangerous. And if we do that, then the third thing, it's awfully easy. If we push God to the margins, then it's easy to push other people. Other people out to the margins and just decide we don't really need to love them. We shape our buildings. And afterwards, our buildings shape us. A picture, a picture came out of the shaping of our buildings. The picture points to the greatest commandment of all that Jesus said. 
so. The question for us today, are we just going to look at the picture or are we going to live the commandment? Well, let's pray about that. Show us, O oh God, these words that you said were most important. We see them everywhere around this church. Help us to live them everywhere that we go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there a response that you would have? An offering of your heart in love? This devotion of love to loving God with all that you are. Are you ready to profess your faith in Jesus Christ? Is there a response that would move you into membership in this church family? Because here is a place where you can love neighbor and be loved by neighbor. This is what's most important. So we're going to sing number 212, I love you, Lord. And as we sing, I'll be right here at the front and I invite you to come and share a decision with us. Would you stand? Would you sing? Would you be seated for just a moment? It is a great joy for me to present to you Ella Reinecke. And she comes professing her faith in Jesus Christ. She was a part of a group at Bible school that had good conversations with Elizabeth talking about what it means to follow Jesus. And I think it's appropriate on this day when we talk about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. You're stepping forward to say that you want to do that, be baptized. And as she comes, we rejoice. Parents are Rhett and Christy, and let's see, a grandmother, Faye Terry, out there, and a brother, Will Henry. All right. And we all rejoice as the larger family. So if you are excited about her decision, and if you will help Ella as she grows in her faith, in following Jesus, would you raise your hand, say amen. 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 So I'm going to ask you to stand right here at the front with family, with you all and anybody else who wants to come, and take a moment before you leave and come down and offer your words of blessings for Ella at this time. One other announcement before we go, we're having a backyard Bible club at Hillcrest Baptist Church this Wednesday from five to seven, we'd love to have some volunteers. You see pictures 
inside your bulletin about some of what is going on there. If you would like to be a part of that mission work, we would love for you to do that and contact Tommy. He would be the one. Now as we leave this place, how are we going to go into the world? Are we going to go and live this commandment that Jesus said was the greatest of all? So take the picture that you see all around here and let's go and live it. Would you stand for our benediction as we prepare to go? And as we go to live this great commandment, Christ, go before you to prepare a way of service. Christ, go behind you to gather up all of your efforts for his glory. Christ, go beside you as leader and guide. Christ, go within you as comfort and stay. Christ, go beneath you to uphold with everlasting arms. Christ, go above you to reign as Lord Supreme. Amen. Amen. Amen.